Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to your Father's house. Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you for Sunday morning. We thank you, God, that you've placed on our hearts the desire to be in your house, or to tune in online and to join with this family of faith. We thank you, God, that you put a song in our hearts, a song of praise to the one who's loved us with a love that will never let us go. And I ask, God, that during this service, you would be glorified, we would be changed, and we would be ready when we leave this place to serve you more faithfully, to love you more dearly until we meet again. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please sign the little yellow attendance card that's in the pew rack. Uh, put that in with your offering in the offering plates. Uh, I haven't been asked to do this, but I think it'd be a good idea that if you're coming to eat for Vacation Bible School the next uh, four nights, just put on there that you're going to be eating with us. That'll help the kitchen team prepare the right amount of food. This is the week for Vacation Bible School. Starts tomorrow night at 5.30, goes through Thursday. Uh, we eat from 5.30 till 6, and then we'll come in the sanctuary for worship, puppet show. Uh, then we'll go to our different classes, uh, classes for all ages of kids and for teenagers. And then we have an adult class also. So I'll be teaching the adults the same lessons that the kids are being taught. Uh, and the theme is about construction. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I hope you'll be here to join us. Youth Summer Camp is the following week. Uh, they're going down to French Camp, Mississippi, to a camp uh, that they've enjoyed uh, many times before, and I hope you'll keep them in your prayers. And then one last announcement, Operation Christmas Child is the uh, ministry of Samaritan's Purse, Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son. Uh, our church has been a big part of that ministry for a very long time. And we're being asked uh, by the team that does that here at Highland Heights to begin thinking about some things that you'd put in the box. Uh, lots of things are on sale right now, and I hope you'll go out, buy some things uh, for your Operation Christmas Child box. And I believe that's all I had. Let's continue our worship. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Great. So Linda Rush, our senior adults uh, ministry leader, is talking about Bockerman's, going to Bockerman's. It's not this Wednesday, but the next. Meet out there at 11 o'clock, I believe is right. Um, I'll tell you something funny. The ministry is called TOPS, which is Trusting, Obeying, Praying Seniors. And one of the gentlemen who goes uh, to that meeting told me the last time he couldn't remember what it was called. And his son said, what does TOPS stand for? And he said, I don't know, taking old people out for soup. <laughs> so kind of that's what we're doing because Barkerman's has soup and sandwiches, right? So uh, let's continue our worship. And we'll carpool from the church. Gotcha. Good morning, good morning to you. Please join us in worship with Alive and Breathing.
worship this morning is taken from Psalm 122. I rejoiced with those who said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. That is where the tribes of Israel go up. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's continue singing together, Jesus Messiah.
Please be seated. <clears throat> My youngest son gave me something really cool for Father's Day. It's an attachment that goes on the pressure washer, and it's about like this, and it'll scrub a big area so quickly. So yesterday afternoon, he and I were cleaning one of our patios in the back, and I got to thinking, you know, I just did this last year at the same time, but there's all this mildew, all this dirt, and then we miracle grow plants, so there's all this residue, this blue-green residue, right? But this thing scrubbed it off, and I mean, we were through in about 10 minutes. And if you'll bear with me for the analogy, it got me thinking about how God cleans us up. A year ago, we thought we were cleaned up, but we sinned again, didn't we? We hurt somebody, we didn't do something we should have, we broke the commandments, we haven't loved each other as Christ has loved us. And every Sunday we're reminded that He cleans us and scrubs us because He loves us and gives us another chance. Does that analogy work for you? It sure works for me. Let's bow our heads. God, I give you thanks that in this service of worship, there's always a place for confession. We come into your house singing, praising you for who you are. And that has a way of reminding us of who we are. We're sinners. We confess that we've made mistakes. We've lashed out at each other, especially We've hurt the people we love the most, sometimes by what we did and sometimes by what we didn't do and, and didn't want to do. We've broken your commandments. We're dirty. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to make us clean again, to give us another chance. And thank you, God, that until we go to heaven, we know because the Bible teaches us so, that you continue to forgive and clean, forgive and clean. And yet we do pray that you won't have to wash away some of the same old stuff that's plagued our lives for years. God, would you tap on our shoulder? Would you pierce our hearts? Cleanse us help there to be a time, not just in heaven, but in this life also, when we don't repeat the same mistakes. Thank you, God, for a place to worship. Thank you, God, for wonderful technology that allows people to watch online until they can come back to church, or perhaps if they're living away or are not comfortable, they'll continue to watch. Thank you for that technology. Thank you, God, for those who run it and use it. Thank you for a nation where freedom of religion and speech is guaranteed. And when it's challenged, as it has been over these past few months, the Supreme Court and others have held steadfast in keeping us with freedom of religion freedom of expression. And would you hear us now as together as your people gathered in this place we say the prayer taught to Jesus taught Jesus by excuse me taught by Jesus to his disciples to that group of people who were not perfect but who loved him and were forgiven by him just as we make mistakes but we're forgiven and loved by you and would you help us to pay attention to the voices around us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Would you stand, please? We're going to say what we believe, and we say this along with billions of people all over the world. Christians believe these things about God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because I'm preaching this series on Ephesians, and today we're in a section where Paul talks about the church, I want you to pay attention particularly to what we say we believe about Christ's church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the one holy and universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. we've got folks out of town, but surely we've got some children here. We've got about 30 registered for Vacation Bible School, so hope some of these kids are coming in. Are yours here, Barbara? Your children here? Okay. Hopefully they're coming over from the nursery. Good deal. All right. Come on in. Okay, y'all come sit right up here. Come sit right here for me. Okay. Hey, buddy, come on, sit down. All right, well, I'm, Pastor Tim's going to sit down, and I want to show you how you can do something really cool with your hands. So hold your hands up. Can I see your hands? We're going to make a church out of our hands. So what we'll do is we'll take our fingers and put them like this. Okay? And then we're going to do our pointer fingers like this. And then we're going to do our thumbs like this. And we have a church. And everybody might want to try that. Okay? So we've got our fingers like this. And our pointer fingers like this. And here are our thumbs. And here's what we say. We say, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors, and there are all the people. All right, do it with me. Here's the church. Come on, I need the church's help. Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors, and there are all the people. So we might say, here's the people we've got. Adults, we got moms and dads and grandparents and boys and girls, and they're all in the church. Because the church isn't just this building. Now, this is a beautiful building, and I love it. And up on top of it is that steeple with the cross. But inside, it's even better, because that's where God's people are this morning. Does that make sense? Does that sound good? Okay. Let's do it one more time. Maybe you can try. Okay, you ready? Maybe Miss Rebecca, maybe y'all you can help them in children's church too. All right, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors, and there are all the people. Okay, now put your hands together like this this time, and let's pray. Father, I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you.
une femme. our worship now through giving our tithes and our offerings. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for all the gifts of this life and the promise of the life to come. Thank you, God, for being so generous with us. And we ask, God, that you would remind us of the words of our Savior, who said that where our treasure is, there will be our heart also. May our treasure more and more reside in you, and less and less in things. Thank you for the generosity of this church, God. Thank you that a girl's dormitory is being built in our orphanage in Kenya because of the generosity of this church. Thank you, God, that children are being fed day in and day out. That this church continues to be a lighthouse. That worship services are held. That preschool goes on, that AA meets here five times a week, that adults and children will be here together next week for Vacation Bible School. Thank you, God, for all the many and varied ways you use our generosity to tell others about you. May it always be so until you return. In Jesus' name, amen. The church is one foundation.
seated. Seems to me that's one of the great old hymns of the church. Touches my heart every time we sing it. Well, in this series on Ephesians, we're looking at verses 15 through 23 in the first chapter. And Paul is going to talk about his love for the church and the importance of the church, the centrality of the church. The old Scots, our Presbyterian ancestors, called the church a spiritual society. I like that. So we're going to look at as an Old Testament lesson at a time when David lifts up the church in Old Testament times. It was the temple in Jerusalem. And let's hear what he says in Psalm 122. I rejoiced with those who said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. There the thrones for judgment stand, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your prosperity. And then turn with me to Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, as we talked about last week. It's a letter that was shared in those house churches and then was sent out to other churches. So it's a, it's a letter that many Christians read, many Christians memorized long before we had a printed Bible. Now I'm going to do something here. I'm going to take a little liberty because I want to make a point. Paul is talking about the church. So whenever he says you or your, in the Greek it's plural. So I'm going to say y'all, okay? I'm going to make it southern. I want you to get the point. You cannot be a Christian by yourself. It's a corporate expression of God's love. For this reason, ever since I heard about y'all's faith in the Lord Jesus and y'all's love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for y'all, remembering y'all in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give y'all the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that y'all may know Him better. I pray also that the eyes of y'all's hearts may be enlightened in order that y'all may know the hope to which He has called y'all, the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of His mighty strength, which He exerted in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under His feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is God's word. Treasure it. Believe it. Let's bow our heads. God, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for this particular letter written by Paul when he was under house arrest. Thank you for preserving these words all down through the ages. In spite of the Bible being maligned and burned and neglected, it still stands. And we ask that these words would find a place in our hearts. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Memphis is a city known for her, you fill in the blank, her music, her king, right, Elvis, her barbecue, all those things are true. But the way that I want to fill in the blank this morning is Memphis is a city known for her churches. Now, as Memphians, we often take churches for granted. Everywhere you look, on almost every corner, almost every major street, there are churches. And it's not like that in other cities. My great-uncle Jim used to love to come to Memphis once a year. And he liked the barbecue, and he liked Elvis. But he came here very often to see the churches. He lived in L.A. And he would have my grandfather drive him all over town so he could see the steeples and the different types of churches, all the different denominations. Memphis is a city known for her churches. Well, there are four ways to define church, the house of the Lord, if you will. The first way is a building. So the first thing we probably think about when we think about a church is a building. And there are all different types of buildings. Ours is very traditional. People come here for the first time and they often say, this looks like a church. Now, in different parts of the world, churches look different. But this does look like a traditional American church. But then you have other types of churches, other buildings, small, medium, large. Did you know that the largest evangelical Presbyterian church is right here in Memphis? Hope Presbyterian, that little church in our backyard. One of the largest Baptist churches in the whole nation is here. The church that has the three beautiful crosses, Bellevue Baptist, right? And then also all over the city is a collection of small and medium-sized churches. All different types. All different kinds of buildings. Another way to define church is a people. A group of people. And most of the time when somebody asks you, where do you go to church? You think about your congregation right here. Who are we? A congregation of people. And then a third way is to say visible. So the church fathers talked about the visible church. That is, all of those all over this planet who call themselves Christian. In the Apostles' Creed, the traditional way of saying that is the Holy Catholic Church with a little c. It means Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, non-denominational, all of us. And then a, third, a fourth way, rather, to think about the church is to define the church as invisible. Now, what does that mean? That doesn't mean you can't see the church, but invisible in theology means as seen to God, not necessarily known to us. It's what John talks about in Revelation 7, 9. A great multitude no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every language, every people. Billions of us, those who've gone to heaven already and those of us who still inhabit this planet. That's the invisible church. Paul's love for the church at Ephesus led him to write, Ever since I heard about y'all's faith in the Lord Jesus and y'all's love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for y'all, remembering y'all in my prayers. The church is this beautiful expression. Buildings, people, denominations, groups, all who love Jesus Christ. It is impossible on an individual basis to truly know God and to truly know His people by yourself. You can't do that. It's always been corporate. Always. And so I want to talk about four aspects of this corporate thing, this corporate group, this corporate people we call the church. The first one is the church's foundation. As the old hymn says, the church's one foundation. Now, practically, when we think about this particular church building, the foundation is a concrete slab. But theologically, spiritually, the foundation is Jesus. 
We stand on His love. We trust in Him. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is His new creation by water, baptism, and the Word by the Bible. From heaven He came down and sought her to be His holy bride. He sought us. He he found us. With His own blood He bought her, and for her life He died. The Bible speaks of the church in feminine terms. And that's something that all of us ought to be grateful for. It lifts the church up. God talks about the church as the bride of Christ. I have a picture on my desk. It's Renee, my wife, on our wedding day. She looks so beautiful, so radiant. And she still is. When I look at that picture, I think about what Paul what the Bible talks about, the bride of Christ. My hope is built on nothing less, says another hymn, than Jesus' blood and righteousness. All the other foundations that we tend to have in this life, they're like sinking sand. One of the lessons at VBS this week is going to be about what do we build our house on? Do we build it on rock or do we build it on sand? Every other foundation that's built on sand is going to fall away. It's going to be washed away. We may think, well, I'm building my life on on who I am, on my individuality. That's going to wash away. Well, I'm building my life on my vigor, my health. You're going to lose your health one day. Well, I'm going to build my life on my gifts and on the things I like to do. Well, those are going to change, and not everybody has the same gifts. Well, then I'll build my life on how good I am. Well, if you compare yourself to Jesus, if I compare myself to Jesus, that's a pretty weak foundation. We need to build it on Christ. That's the foundation of life. And so Paul pens these words, God placed Christ far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. So our foundation is built on the one who is above everything else. That is always the church's foundation. And then secondly, let's look at the church's strength. The church's strength comes from our connection corporately to God and to one another. And we may think on a day like today, and we've been thinking as coronavirus restrictions were lifted and people were coming back to church, yet we looked around and we thought, well, where is everybody? And this is one of those Sundays when lots of people are out of town. So where's the strength of the church? The strength is still there because of Jesus. He still connects us to Him and to one another. That's why the hymn writer said, Elect from every nation, yet one or all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth, one holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food, communion, and to one hope she presses with every grace endued. There are billions of us on this planet. We are the largest faith group. The church continues to be strong. And I pray for the day when churches are filled again in this country, as they are in Africa, as they are in Asia, as they are in South and Central America. The church is a loving fellowship of the redeemed who listen, worship together, pray together, and serve together. And it seems to me that in this hundredth year of our own church's history, our worship is sweeter. Our prayers are stronger, and our service continues to grow and grow and grow. Paul penned, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give y'all the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that y'all may know Him better. Now listen to me. You cannot know God fully and completely by yourself. That is a myth. You've got to know God with others. By yourself, you will become depressed. And you will think that you are the authority. 
But in the context of the church, you continually sing and pray and hear the Bible and learn from each other. Faith has always been corporate. God reached down, He called Abraham and his family. God always calls groups of people. And then let's talk about the church's battle. Battle. It's a battle against evil. It's a battle that the church has fought from the very beginning. And the old hymn writer wrote this, "Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war. Doing church is hard. It's always been hard, and there are seasons in history when it's particularly hard, and this is one of those seasons. Doing church is not easy, but it wasn't supposed to be anyway. My grandfather used to say, anything hard is worth doing. Anything worth doing should be hard. And what about the tribulation? What does that mean? It means that all throughout her history, the church has had trouble. Sometimes we cause our own trouble. And other times, the world brings trouble upon us. In my Sunday school class this morning, we were talking about the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s. God allowed that trouble to happen so that the Protestant church could be birthed and the Catholic church could be reformed. God was telling us then and now, get back to my word. The church has to battle. And yet, as the hymn writer says, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. I hate to wait. And I imagine you're like me in many ways. We want peace and we want it now. But that's not what God is working out. It's in His time. Till with the vision glorious, her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victorious becomes the church at rest. Victorious. We're on the winning team. The team of God's love and God's power and God's justice, that's the winning team. It may look sometimes like we have more losses than we have wins, but that's only the way we look at it. We don't see like God sees it. Christ's church battles evil from within and from without. Now, what do I mean by that? The church battles evil from within because the church is made up of sinners. Because the church is made up of us. And you probably have heard the old joke, I was looking for a perfect church, but then when I joined, they said, it ain't perfect anymore. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. And we battle evil from without. Because particularly in this season in America, the church is under attack. There are plenty of people that want to see churches and chapels closed. They're not going to win. In California, those who wanted the churches closed for a long time, well, they lost. And the Supreme Court said, no, the church can open. If Walmart and the casinos can open and follow some guidelines, then the church certainly can as well. In fact, those states have had to reimburse the church in many cases. Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Those who are against us are not going to win. And my prayer is that those who are against us will realize the futility of what they're doing and God will draw them to Himself also. It's happened before. And so Paul penned these words. God's incomparably great power for us, not individual, for us who believe is like the working of His mighty strength when He raised Christ from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly realms. The power that raises people from the dead is the greatest power in the universe. It's God's power. And God says that kind of power is at work in the corporate body we call the church. And then finally, what is the church's hope? Our hope is this corporate expression of God's grace. 
We get a taste of it in this life, and we get it completely in heaven. Yet she on earth hath union, said the hymn writer, with God the three in one, and mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O happy ones and holy, Lord, give us grace that we, like them the meek and lowly on high, may dwell with Thee. The longer I live, the closer I feel to heaven. Because people I love are in heaven. The church is not just us here. The church is all those believers in all times in God's heaven. And so the old Scottish theologian wrote this. In the common joys and sorrows which Christians and none but Christians, plural, none but Christians share. In the same sin escaped and the same salvation won, there is a union of the most intimate kind produced and cemented. The foundation under this carpet is concrete, but the stronger cement is that spiritual bond we have with God and with one another, those who've gone on before us, those of us who are still here. And so Paul penned, the church is Christ's body, the fullness of Him who fills everything in every way through the church and through the church only. We have an intimacy with God and with one another that is only possible in a corporate way. I thank God for the church. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Almighty God, thank you for the church's one foundation. Jesus, thank you, God, for the church's strength, the very power that raised Jesus from the dead. Thank you, God, even for the church's battle. Thank you for giving us convictions and helping us do corporately what we could never do individually. And thank you for the church's hope that we will know your grace intimately and with one another forever and ever and ever. Thank you, God, for your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Join in singing, Blessed Be the Tie.
Well, I did better. About 12.15 last Sunday, we had a good bit going on in the service, and I had a little longer sermon, so uh, to those who are looking at the clock, it's noon. I did better. <laughs> Don't clap, Joey, that's too much. We sang, Blessed be the tie that binds. There's a tie that binds us. It's Christ, and it's the tie we have with each other. If you'd like to talk to me about what it might mean to be a part of this family of faith, if you'd like to ask questions about that, I'm ready to talk. I'm ready to sit down, talk on the phone. I want to tell you about this place, these people we call Highland Heights. Now may God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.